So in this lecture, I'm going to begin to um, introduce you to viruses and the structure of viruses. And then in the next videos, I'll talk about viral replication and about eukaryotes. So uh, viruses were too small for us to see. And the idea of a virus was proposed by Louis Pasteur. Um, and it was really just an explanation for an infection that was caused by something that was unknown. So we knew that um, we could see bacteria and we could link bacteria to um, a certain infectious disease. But because we couldn't see viruses, um, it took us a while to sort of develop the field of virology, which really didn't come around until the 1950s when we advanced the technology to be able to see something so small. So just to give you a perspective, and by this point you've already seen a bacteria um, under the microscope in the lab, so you know how, how tiny they are, even under our highest magnification of a light microscope. That here, you know, E. coli are about two micrometers, where Ebola is about half that size, um, a rhinovirus is about the tenth of that size, and there's some that are even smaller, and that's why they're so difficult to see and why it took us so long to sort of develop the field. Now, if you look here, um, this slide, I keep this slide in here because it kind of gives you a, a, a bullet point overview of everything that I'm going to talk about um, in this, so the properties of a virus, and we're going to, I'm going to go into detail about this, but it's good to kind of go back and take a look at it. Now, we've already talked about um, viruses not being living organisms. So they are not cells. They are parasites. They cannot perform or fulfill the characteristics of life. So I'm going to talk now about the basic structure and, you know, what do they have? Like, what is their, their makeup? I'll skip past this. This just shows you some um, pictures of some viruses at different sizes and different shapes. Um, so if we look here, you can see the external structure. So the external structure is called a capsid, and they come in all different uh, shapes and sizes. This is a cylindrical. Um, this is actually a bowler right here. Um, and then these are some round uh, capsids. So we'll take a look at, you know, how does that structure come about? So the, a virus really contains only two, maybe three parts. So viruses are a protein coating on the outside called a capsid, and then inside there is some nucleic acid. And uh, it's either a DNA or an RNA. And so that whole thing together, the capsid with the nucleic acid in the inside, is called a nucleocapsid. Now some viruses have, sorry, some viruses have a, um, an envelope as well. If they don't have an envelope, they're called naked. If they do, they're called enveloped viruses. And I'll go into detail about them here, about an envelope in a second. So this kind of gives you a picture of the nucleocapsid of, of both a naked and an enveloped virus. So this blue right here is uh, the capsid. Okay, and then interior to it, this is supposed to be on the inside, is the strand of some nucleic acid. Whereas an envelope virus, it has this extra envelope that is made up of these, uh, these spikes. Now this envelope actually comes from the host cell, uh, which when we look at viral replication, you'll see how it is able to incorporate part of the host cell into um, the, the viral structure. So the capsid is actually a sequence of capsomers. The proteins are called capsomers. And they form into these helical shapes. Okay, And so they make this big, long cylinder. And then interior to the cylinder is the nucleic acid. So if we look at it, here is an example of a helical uh, capsid, which has the nucleic acid inside. And if we look at it underneath a microscope, you can see that that's the virus right here. So all you have is this long sort of tube with the nucleic acid inside. Now, a little bit more advanced here is this uh, envelope virus, where you can see the helical um, a capsid formed by all those little capsomers with the nucleic acid inside, and it kind of winds around itself. And then you have the envelope on the outside. So that's another example of that same shape, but just in um, an enveloped form. 
Now the second shape is called an icosahedral. An icosahedral is a 20 dimensional, 20 sided dimensional figure which is made up of these little facets. So this is a facet, this triangle here, which is made up of the same capsomer proteins and it comes together to form this geometrical bubble here with the nucleic acid on the inside. So that is a um, icosahedral shape. Now this shows images of that underneath the microscope. So here you can see that we have the individual capsomers and then, and this is a fluorescent stained uh, virus, and then the entire thing is the capsid. Whereas this uh, has been photoshopped after the image has been taken to sort of accentuate the different parts. You've got the envelope on the outside here and then you've got the capsid and then interior is the nucleic acid. Now, one of the more interesting types of um, uh, viruses is called a bacteriophage. And a bacteriophage is a virus that infects a bacteria. And it's actually a very important tool in genetic engineering. And it looks a lot more complex, but it really isn't. It's still just a combination of proteins and nucleic acids. So we have that icosahedral head here with nucleic acid on the inside. But then there's this complex network of proteins that makes these little alien looking legs here called the tail fibers. And then there is a, um, some tail pins and this sheath that's called and a collar. But essentially, it is all just protein. And when these feet hook onto a host cell, there, remember we talked about proteins having certain shape. When they bind to something, they change their shape. So they essentially change their shape, causing this to drop down and those pins to embed into the um, membrane of a bacteria. And that allows the nucleic acid to shoot into the bacteria. So even though it looks a lot more complex, it still is just a network of proteins and nucleic acid. So I said I'd talk a little bit about the viral envelope. The viral envelope is actually part of the host cell membrane. So when the virus leaves the host cell to go find a new cell to attack, it takes part of the membrane with, that, with it. And in the surface of that membrane are some spikes, and they're called glycoproteins. And that, those spikes allow it to bind to the new host cell. So it looks similar to the cell it came from, makes it easier to find a similar host cell attached and then, um, you know, invade that host cell. Now the function of the capsid is just to protect the nucleic acids and like I said, DNA or RNA is um, interior to them. And in some instances like the bacteriophage, the um, uh, the capsid is actually responsible for uh, helping the DNA and the RNA enter the cell. But if we look at it from the other perspective, um, from you know the human perspective, one of the things about the capsid and the envelope is that it stimulates an immune response. So our body is designed to recognize anything that is foreign. And since viruses are fairly um, simple organisms, the Capsid is actually responsible for eliciting an, an immune response. If our body is able to recognize it, antibodies can recognize the foreign nature of the viral capsid. Now, uh, the nucleic acids on the inside, they, like I said, they can be DNA or RNA, and they only contain the, uh, a very few genes in order to allow the virus to invade and, and replicate within a host cell. So remember, they can't do any of that themselves. So they only have what is, is necessary in order to take over the host cell and allow the host cell to do it for it. Now, we group viruses into different groups based on their nucleic acids and their envelopes and, you know, the shape of their nucleic acids. So DNA viruses can be either single-stranded or double-stranded, and double-stranded can be linear or circle. So if we take a look at um, these groups of, and these are just specifically, like, medically significant viruses, we see first we divide them into enveloped and non-enveloped. And then all envelope viruses are double-stranded uh, DNA viruses. So those are pox viruses and herpes viruses. And don't worry about memorizing this. I'm just sort of giving you a general idea of how we group them. Then with non-envelope viruses, they can be double-stranded or single-stranded. If they're single-stranded, they're parvoviruses. 
If they're double-stranded, if they're linear, they're adenoviruses, and if they're circular, they're papovaviruses. Okay, so that's how we divide them into different, into different taxonomical groups or families. Now, RNA viruses are, are interesting because DNA is really what codes for genes. So a virus that has RNA in it is a little bit different. An RNA virus, um, they're single-stranded, and there can be either positive or negative sense. So the positive sense RNA is when you have RNA that acts like DNA. It's actually the code or the message. Excuse me, that's negative sense. The positive sense RNA is where you have um, essentially what is messenger RNA that can be directly translated into proteins. A negative sense RNA virus is when it acts like DNA. So it needs to be, the RNA needs to be transcribed and then translated. Okay, so positive sense is when you essentially have messenger RNA that can be directly made into proteins. Negative sense RNA is when the RNA acts like DNA. It needs to be transcribed and then uh, can be translated. Some RNA viruses can also have uh, segments. So instead of having one long single strand, they'll have tiny little segments where you have different genes in each segment of the RNA virus. And again, we group them the same way we do the, um, the uh, DNA viruses. So we split them in non-enveloped and enveloped, and then non-enveloped single-stranded and non-enveloped uh, double-stranded get different names. And then envelope single-stranded, we've got segmented and non-segmented, so you can see their um, names there. And then uh, having single-stranded genome encoding for reverse transcriptase, this retrovirus here, that's the negative sense virus. So the one that has RNA that then needs to be transcribed. And so typically human cells don't transcribe RNA, right? We transcribe DNA. So they actually carry around their own little enzyme called reverse transcriptase in order for the host cell to be able to, you know, be able to transcribe RNA even though it doesn't typically do that. So that pretty much is the makeup of uh, viruses. Some other viruses very rarely contain some enzymes they take with them. Like I said, the reverse transcriptase, some of them take polymerase, which is needed to make DNA and RNA. Some of them make replicase that copies RNA. So some of them do carry around some enzymes from host to host. But remember, they can't make the enzymes themselves. The host will make the enzyme, and then they just take them with them to the next uh, host cell once they leave. Alright, so in the next video I'll actually talk about how they enter, replicate, and leave the cell.